does as well. Uh, there's an echo. Okay. Okay, resolved. Um, also, if the remedy could impact somebody's career in a very meaningful way, that increases risk. Uh, also, if public statements are made about an individual um, that could harm their reputation, um, and those, uh, those statements are, are false or made with, uh, with reckless disregard for their uh, truth or falsity, that also increases risk. So this is really, really hard work. Um, as I mentioned before, you can't make everybody happy, um, but you can treat everybody with respect and ensure a fair and thorough process. Also, uh, when incidents are public in nature, um, and even when they're not public in nature, I mean, communities are, are tight groups of people who form friendships and collaborate and work closely. Uh, and uh, any incident uh, can become highly politicized and divisive within a community. So fairness is really essential. Uh, actual fairness and the optics are important to be uh, mindful of as well. So at a very high level, what does code of conduct fairness look like? Um, well, first of all, everybody needs to have notice of the acceptable standards of conduct, what behavior is okay and what behavior is not okay in this community, and that's usually expressed through the code of conduct itself. The process for enforcement needs to be clear and transparent. Uh, the investigation uh, needs to be fair and thorough. So all available evidence uh, needs to be considered in evaluating uh, the outcome. And if consequences beyond just a warning or a conversation or mediation are under consideration, it's very important to give the accused person an opportunity to be heard and present their perspective inside of the story. and uh, and evidence. Um, there, will, there may be some rare situations where that is not appropriate um, because it would expose certain people to further harm uh, or the risks of retaliation are so great and the evidence, the documentary evidence is so clear. But if there is a he said, she said, they said situation, um, it's often important to interview um, everybody involved and invite them to present uh, any documentary evidence that they have. Um, Triers of fact need to be impartial. That's so important. So if there is a member of the Code of Conduct Committee who is the accused person or close friends with the accused person or a direct target or victim of the alleged wrongdoing or a close friend or uh, somebody with a close professional relationship to that person, um, it's very important that they not only recuse themselves, uh, but that they're not allowed to access confidential information about the investigation. And any consequences need to be appropriate given both the severity of the wrongdoing uh, and the impact uh, to the community. And sometimes there's a situation where the severity of the wrongdoing and the impact of the community are kind of in opposite directions. And that, that, creates, a, that creates a unique challenge in, in determining you know, what's, the right, what's the right remedy here. Uh, your documentation uh, should uh, address, in addition to what the acceptable standards of conduct are, how to report violations, who is responsible for responding to a resolving code of conduct incidents, how the conflicts of interest will be dealt with, and what your policies are related to protecting the anonymity and privacy of reporters, uh, witnesses, victims, and targets. Uh, ideally, your code of conduct uh, documentation would also address these, uh, these issues. Um, whether the code of conduct can be enforced uh, outside of community spaces and to what extent. Uh, the appeal process, if you have an appeal process, um, I'd say that it's a minority of communities that have an appeal process uh, at this point in time, uh, but there are communities that do have an appeal process. Um, the code of conduct committee's ability to uh, delegate or escalate uh, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the situations in which that might be important uh, later. Um, and then how the Code of Conduct Enforcement team uh, fits into the broader governance structure of the community. It's, it's really critical that triers of fact be impartial and independent. Um, so we talked earlier about recusal. Uh, 
Also, consider thinking, uh, thinking about the difference between a hard conflict and a soft conflict. So hard conflicts are where somebody is actually directly involved in an incident as a victim or target or the accused person. And there might be some soft conflicts as well that may give the appearance of bias and partiality, um, but it's kind of a close call whether or not there's actually a conflict of interest that would prevent this person from exercising independent decision making. Um, So sometimes uh, everybody in the Code of Conduct Committee has a conflict of interest, uh, actual or perceived or hard conflict or soft conflict. There are also situations where the severity of the offense is so great and the legal risks are so great um, and the, the number of hours required to investigate uh, are so great that it may make sense to pull in outside help. Um, so, for example, hiring an independent professional external investigator, um, uh, having alternates in the community who have gone through training and are available uh, to step in if everybody uh, on, in the primary committee has to recuse themselves due to a conflict of interest. Consistency uh, is also very important for a fair process. Um, so. You want to treat similar violations similarly in terms of the consequences, remedies, and uh, outcome. Uh, you don't want to give lighter consequences to somebody um, you know, just because they're popular in the community or they're, they're in a leadership role, um, or else that will, that will undermine the actual and perceived far fairness. Uh, so every time you make a decision uh, as an incident responder, you are setting precedent for how similar violations in the future are going to be handled. It's very important to balance transparency with privacy. Um, it's important to be transparent about your processes, about your procedures, and about uh, your policies, how it is you go about responding to and resolving incidents. Um, but it's when it comes to the content of an incident, particularly if the um, the facts uh, underlying the incident could expose uh, victims or targets or witnesses to retaliation or embar embarrassment. Um, it's very, very important to protect their privacy. So we'll talk a little bit about best practices throughout the process. And I have a, a flow chart here uh, that talks about the stages of incident response. You know, first, you receive a report. Um, or otherwise learn of a potential violation, then there's investigation or just gathering facts, and that can either be immediate, I mean, that can be, or it can sometimes take many months, uh, depending on how clear the facts are, how much documentary evidence you have, and how many witnesses need to be, need to be interviewed. Uh, and then there's the process of the committee getting together, um, or if you don't have a committee, all the incident responders getting together, and determining what should be the remediation and the outcome if there, if there is a violation or, or there's, uh, there is problematic behavior. Um, mediation can be part of this process of both gathering facts and determining what the, the best outcome is. Um, and if there are consequences, particularly if you're pursuing a restorative or transformative justice outcome, um, it's important to have accountability for ensuring that um, everybody who has agreed to participate in the restorative outcome follows through um, on what they've uh, on their on their assigned role. And then it's important to document uh, and communicate the results to the involved parties, and to some extent. Um, the broader community, again, while protecting confidentiality and privacy. So uh, when responding to a report, um, it's important to let, uh, thank reporters for, for coming forward and um, treat their report with uh, sensitivity and, and care, um, and also let them know what the process is going to look like. And if you have great documentation in your processes, you can, you can just link to that great documentation. Um, and of course, let them know that they will be uh, informed when the, when the investigation is completed. Uh, sometimes it's necessary to uh, implement in interim protective measures uh, even before an investigation is completed. Uh, if the 
nature of the alleged violation is severe enough that it creates a risk uh, to community health and safety, uh, it may be necessary to take interim actions right away. So for example, removing somebody from an event or temporarily banning them from project spaces until the investigation can be completed and it can be determined what should be the, the more permanent uh, remediation if, uh, if necessary. So if just a uh, warning is going to be issued, um, it's, not, it's not often, it's not always necessary to perform a, a thorough uh, investigation, um, but if anything beyond a warning might be appropriate, um, it is important to be thorough in gathering information, uh, interviewing all available witnesses. Um, and this is something that code of conduct uh, responders can often uh, be subject to criticism from the broader community for. Um, often community members, I mean, again, we work in, we work in open source, uh, and we're used to things happening very, very quickly. Uh, when there's a bug, we get it fixed right away. Uh, when it comes to human issues, human bugs, <laughs> um, those are often require a lot more care and a lot more time to resolve. Uh, it's important to take careful notes throughout the process, um, especially if there is a high risk of uh, legal action or liability. When conducting an interview, um, find a quiet, safe space that you can speak in confidentiality. Um, if the person just experienced uh, harm, um, they could be traumatized, they could be very emotional. Um, it's, so it's very important that you create a safe space uh, in which they can, they can share. Um, if they have immediate needs around safety, um, be sure to address those first, um, and, then, and then proceed with the interview. Uh, I like to encourage, um, if, if I sense that somebody who is a witness or, or a target or somebody who, is, was, um, who may have suffered harm uh, is uh, in a traumatized or emotional state, um, or that they might have fears around retaliation. Um, yeah, I, I, I usually start the interview by encouraging them uh, to, to breathe, um, to go at their own pace, reassure them that it's okay if they, don't, if they don't remember all the facts right now. There will be other opportunities to provide more information. Um, and let them know they can take breaks, um, and otherwise just be kind and uh, sensitive and empathetic while keeping them focused on, on the facts of the incident so that you can, you can gather the information you need. While you are performing the investigation, um, don't offer your opinions about, about whether the code of conduct was violated. Um, that is something for the broader committee to decide after you've gathered all relevant facts. You know, sometimes you'll be speaking to one person and, it, you know, it may sound like a very clear case. And then you speak to another witness or you speak to the, the person who's accused and you learn, oh, wow, there are multiple, there are multiple perspectives to every story. And then when we proceed to the stage of evaluating whether a violation occurred, um, this is usually where the Code of Conduct Committee or the Incident Response Team meets and gathers and reviews the evidence, discusses it, um, and talks about what the appropriate next steps are. So I want to encourage uh, you to think about moving beyond binary outcomes. So in traditional code of conduct response, uh, we decide definitively, has a violation occurred or has it not occurred? And then we decide what the consequences are going to be. That's not essential in every situation. Sometimes, whether a violation occurred is so subjective or so borderline that it's just not clear. Um, sometimes the behavior may not technically violate the code of conduct, but it's still problematic. It's still negatively impacting the community. And so it's still worth having a conversation with that person about, you know, hey, this is a, your, your behavior is impacting other people. Um, it's being disruptive to the community. 
know, can you please, can you please do better? And the goal of conduct, code of conduct resolution is never, it's never to punish. It's to protect and uphold community, health, well-being, and safety, and to reinforce norms of acceptable behavior of how people can treat each other in a community. So when a violation has occurred, um, consider at a min minimum these factors in what the, what the remedies should be. The severity of the behavior, the risks, and impact the community of the behavior, and the impact of the community of the remedy that's under consideration, uh, and whether the violator is able and willing to learn from their mistakes and improve, um, and whether the problematic behavior is a single incident or a recurring pattern of behavior. So let's talk a little bit about restorative and transformative justice. And I'm not, these are complex, rich frameworks and philosophies uh, it's outside the scope of this, in, this uh, presentation to do a deep dive into either. Um, but sort of at the essence, restorative justice is about remedying and repairing the harm that was caused and healing it. Um, and, and although this is somewhat fuzzy, it, it historically has tended to focus on healing the harm between the accused and the person who, who experienced harm as a result of their actions. And transformative justice takes it a, for even further and looks at uh, are there systemic issues that contributed to or encouraged the wrongful behavior? So for example, is the community somehow uh, unintentionally or unconsciously rewarding bad behavior? Is the community not being um, clear about the acceptable standards of conduct when onboarding new members? Um, are project leaders contributing this to the situation by not providing adequate coaching and mentoring uh, as people about community culture as people enter the community? Um, so transformative justice focuses on the, the bigger picture of community and focuses not just on healing between the accused person and the people who directly experience harm, but how do we create healing and resolution at a broader community level? And transformative and restorative justice definitely overlap more than I'm giving them credit for here, um, but I'm presenting them in that way for, for simplicity of, the, uh, of our conversation. So transformative and restorative justice are going to be most successful when there are certain, certain factors present. Um, so when the wrongdoer is willing to show humility and take responsibility for their actions, understand and acknowledge the impact of their actions, and learn from their mistakes and improve, um, that is when it is most likely uh, when a restorative justice outcome is most likely to be successful. If the alleged wrongdoer is not willing to learn from their mistakes, not willing to take responsibility, uh, not willing to acknowledge impact, um, it's very hard to create healing, at least with respect to that particular person's relationships within the community. And to seek a restorative or transformative justice outcome, it's very important that the broader community also take a role in that. Um, the broader community needs to create a safe space for learning and growth to occur without excessive shaming or punishment. Um, the broader community needs to commit to supporting everybody in healing from the incident, uh, supporting people in embracing differing perspectives on an incident, especially when it's really polarizing. So bringing people together so they can see and understand and empathize with how other people see an incident. And there needs to be, there needs to be willingness to um, create systems for accountability um, and providing support even to the accused person in improving their behavior. Maybe it's through coaching or mentoring or education. And if there are systemic issues that are um, creating an environment in which bad behavior can flourish, um, that needs to be addressed as well. 
So when deciding what the remedies or consequences should be um, of uh, alleged wrongdoing or, or uh, a violation, um, historically the traditional, uh, the traditional consequences have been, you know, those are the ones listed in the left. So a warning, a temporary or permanent ban, revoking somebody's leadership position, revocation of certain privileges. Um, when, we, uh, when we're seeking a transformative or restorative outcome, um, there are, sometimes we have to get kind of creative about how do we actually address the underlying harm, right? So sometimes that's in the form of an apology, um, but it's very important that the apology be sincere and that whoever is giving the apology isn't just, it's not just lip service, that they actually understand and internalize the impact of their actions on the community. Uh, it can look like providing the accused person with mentoring, coaching, training, educational opportunities. It could involve requiring the um, accused person to go through anger management training or consent training um, or nonviolent communication training, depending on what the nature of the uh, wrongful behavior was. There could be a community service uh, aspect to it also. Um, if they contributed to creating an unsafe or abusive, toxic environment in some ways, they could be asked to, to support the community in, in enhancing positive cultural norms. Um, they could have a role in actually shifting the culture that encouraged their wrongful behavior in the first place. And that's very powerful. If you can get people involved, uh, aligned to that outcome and purpose, it's so powerful because it creates healing at so many different levels. Um, it's healing and validating for the people who experience harm. It prevents further harm from happening in the community. And it also creates closure and resolution for the person who, who engage in wrongdoing. It allows them a chance to make things right and feel good about being embraced by the community again. And then the community sees that everyone's coming together to create broader healing and resolution for the good of all. And so that is so, so powerful. It's not always easy to get there, but if you can, it's very powerful. One of the tools that uh, can help aid a tr transformative or restorative uh, justice resolution uh, is mediation. And mediation can be formal, it can be informal, uh, it can be done by community members. Um, if it's a particularly challenging incident where emotions are very, very heated, uh, it may be helpful to engage a professional mediator or somebody who has conflict resolution training. Uh, also, um, there are some situations where reported violations aren't really about the code of conduct itself. It's not really about community norms of behavior. It's, it's interpersonal conflict. It's, it's two people who don't like each other for whatever reason and are running, they're, they're butting heads. And it's not the code of conduct incident response team's uh, job to resolve all interpersonal conflicts. But when it starts impacting a project and how people are able to collaborate and move forward and develop great technology, sometimes an intervention and mediation is helpful. So uh, mediation, of course, is only an option when everybody consents to that, when everybody is OK with that. Um, and that includes the people who, uh, who feel harmed uh, by, by the incident. Uh, and sometimes those people don't want to be in the same room as a person that they see as a wrongdoer. Sometimes that's just too hard for them. Sometimes that's traumatizing for them. Uh, and so it's, you have to respect um, the wishes of all people involved. You can't force mediation. Um, but you can also offer, if the people who were harmed by an incident don't want to be in a room with the person who engaged in wrongful behavior, um, you can offer to be an intermediary to convey messages back and forth, including an apology. But again, only if everybody consents. So any type of mediation needs to be 
highly customized to the parties involved and their desires and what they're comfortable with. Also, um, mediation is probably not going to be successful unless everybody is open and receptive. Um, and that means not digging in your heels and saying, you know, I'm right and they're wrong 100%, but having some humility to accept that there are multiple perspectives to every incident. And usually, people are trying their best. Um, in their world, from their lens, um, you know, often uh, people who engage in wrongful behavior aren't, aren't intending to cause harm. If they're intending to cause harm, mediation is probably not the right, right resolution. Um, so a skillful mediator can help prepare the parties for that conversation and help evaluate, are the parties ready for this conversation? Uh, there are a few different styles of mediation. Um, I'm not going to discuss, uh, we don't have time to discuss all of them, um, but some are more formal and less formal. Transformative mediation, I encourage you, if you're, if you're interested in learning more about conflict resolution, I encourage you to, to read and learn about that. Uh, these slides are available uh, uh, on the uh, event platform, um, and so you can follow this link. Uh, transformative mediation uh, is probably the best form of mediation for resolving community conflicts uh, because it's very empowering. It involves the people involved in creating their own remedy and resolution and healing. And uh, in the final uh, steps of incident resolution, um, it's about documenting and, and communicating results. Uh, communicating results to uh, the, the accused person, uh, the people who reported, um, and to some extent, it can involve the broader community. Um, and of course, if there is a, if there is a mediated outcome rather than uh, an outcome determined by the uh, incident responders, um, then the parties involved will participate, uh, can participate in the communications um, that go out to the broader community, if there are communications. Um, so there are some communities uh, like uh, Linux Foundation events that publish transparency reports um, that don't include personally identifying, identifiable information, but include um, the general nature of the incident and how it was resolved. And then there are other transparency uh, report, uh, reporting mechanisms like uh, Kubernetes, for example, that publishes statistics uh, about uh, number of reports received, number of violations found, et cetera. So the accused person has been found in violation. Um, it's important, uh, you know, whether, whether or not that person's going to continue to participate in the community. You know, again, if we're looking at, um, if we're looking at, uh, at supporting people in growing and learning, it, it is important to explain you know, what was the behavior at issue, what was the impact to others, you know, why is that behavior uh, negatively impactful. And if there are appeal rights, of course, uh, communicating that as well. When communicating the reporters, um, the incident response team you know, should have some uh, some discretion and flexibility as to how much they communicate about the, the investigation and, and the outcome, um, always being, uh, always being uh, kind and sensitive and uh, empathetic. So there are some situations in which it's not wise to communicate much information to the broader community, um, particularly if it would expose uh, it, it's difficult to communicate that without exposing the involved people to risk of retaliation or embarrassment. Um, if it's difficult to uh, explain the incident without, uh, even if you don't include identif personally identifying viable information, it can sometimes be easy for community members to guess who the people involved are. And 
In case there is a legal dispute, it's important that you've uh, documented your processes and your deliberations uh, well to establish that there was a fair, thorough, and good faith investigation. And having access to records is also important for um, purposes of consistency. So, uh, and also knowing if somebody, uh, if somebody is a repeat uh, offender. Uh, I, we are almost out of time, so the slides are available. So um, you are welcome to browse through them and contact me if you have questions. Um, but I'm going to wrap up here to see if there are any questions. We have time for probably one or two questions. Nithya, yes. Great question. So Nithya's question was about you know, how do people get trained? Um, so there are some training programs for incident response. Uh, Otter Tech has a uh, good training. Consent Academy offers a much more extensive training that happens over a series of multiple weeks. Um, there probably need to be more training resources developed. Um, and I, I encourage communities and foundations to, uh, to pay for all of their incident responders to go through incident resolution training. Amy. Yeah, so Amy's question was about uh, what do I see as the, the innovation in code of conduct incident resolution? Um, I think the innovation right now really is about bringing a transformative and restorative justice lens to this work. Um, about not just thinking about the incident as something isolated and you know we need to respond to it, but thinking about thinking about it as uh, incidents in the context of a broader system. Oh, so Ava's question is, who are the pioneers um, in uh, doing that work? Um, I don't have. I don't have, um, off the top of my uh, head, I don't have uh, a list of names. Um, I mean, there are, there are pioneers in that thinking generally. Um, I would say that there are a lot of people in this community um, who, are, who are bringing that lens and advocating um, for bringing those perspectives to code of conduct resolution. Yes. So I, I didn't, don't think I quite understood the question. Where the vendor makes weapons, the sponsor, to a conference. So a community member, I remember back at an event, I'm not going to name it, 2019, where a community member felt uncomfortable that they were present there and were asking the organizers for them to leave. That they were leave, but because they were making weapons, that they were in violation of the code of conduct. So they were making physical weapons? Yes, they were military weapons. Oh, OK. So, okay, so the question was about uh, somebody complaining that a vendor at a conference was making a oh, present, okay, uh, because they're a military, military supplier and they make weapons. And were they, they, were they bringing weapons to the event or distributing them? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know, of course, all the facts there, and I don't know, um, I don't know what that code of conduct uh, for that community, um, how that reads. Oh, okay, sorry, we're out of time. I'll, I'll, I'll chat with you offline about that. Thank you, everybody.